In the Time of the Butterflies by Julia Alvarez, Part 1, Chapter 2, Minerva, 1938-1941-1944, Complications, 1938. I don't know who talked Papa into sending us away to school. Seems like it would have taken the same angel who announced to Mary that she was pregnant with God and God and got her to be glad about it. The four of us had to ask permission for everything. To walk to the fields to see the tobacco filling out. To go to the lagoon and dip our feet on a hot day. To stand in front of the store and pet the horses as the men loaded up their wagons with supplies. Sometimes, watching the rabbits in their pens, I'd think, I'm no different from you, poor things. One time, I opened a cage and set a half-grown doe free. I even gave her a slap to get her going. But she wouldn't budge. She was used to her little pen. I kept slapping her, harder each time, until she started whimpering like a scared child. I was the one hurting her, insisting she be free. Silly bunny, I thought. You're nothing at all like me. It started with Patrio wanting to be a nun. Mama said, uh, "Mama was all for having a religious, or for having a religious in the family, but Papa did not approve in the least. More than once, he said that Patria as a nun would be a waste of a pretty girl. He only said that once in front of Mama, but he repeated it often enough to me. Finally, Papa gave in to Mama." He said Patria could go away to the convent school if it wasn't one just for being or just for becoming a nun. Mama agreed. So when it came time for Patria to go down to a Immaculata Conception Concepcion, I asked Papa if I could go along. That way I could chaperone my older sister who was a, who was already a grown up senorita. And she had told me all about how girls became senoritas too. Papa laughed, his eyes flashing proudly at me. The others said I was his favorite. I don't know why, since I was the one always standing up to him. He pulled me to his lap and said, And who was going to chaperone you? They, they, I said, so all three of us could go together. He pulled a long face. If all my little chickens go, what will become of me? I thought he was joking, but his eyes had their serious look. Papa, I informed him. You might as well get used to it. In a few years, we're all going to marry and leave you. For days he quoted me, shaking his head sadly and concluding, A daughter is a needle in the heart. Mama didn't like him saying so. She thought he was being critical because their only son had died a week after he was born. And just three years ago, Maria Teresa was born a girl instead of a boy. Anyhow, Mama didn't think it was a bad idea to send all three of us away. Enrique... Those girls need some learning. Look at us. Mama had never admitted it, but I suspected she couldn't even read. What's wrong with us? Papa countered, gesturing out the window where wagons waited to be loaded before his warehouses. In the last few years, Papa had made a lot of money from his farm. Now we had class, and Mama, and Mama argued we needed the education to go along with our cash. Papa caved in again but said one of us had to stay to help mine the store. He always had a little, had to add a little something to whatever Mama came up with. Mama said he was just putting his mark on everything so no one would, could say Enrique Mirabal didn't wear the pants in this family. I knew what he was up to, all right. When Papa asked uh, which one of us would stay with to be his little helper, he looked directly at me. I didn't say a word. I kept studying the floor like maybe my school lessons were chalked on those boards. I didn't need to worry. The day always was the smiling little miss. I'll stay and help Papa. Papa looked surprised because really De Day was a year older than me. She and Patria should have been the two to go away. But then Papa thought it over and said De Day could go along too. So it was settled. All three of us would go to Immaculada Concepcion. Me and Patria would start in the fall and today would follow in January since Papa wanted the math whiz to help with the books during the busy harvest season. And that's how I got free. I don't mean just going to sleepaway school on a train with a trunk full of new things. I mean in my head after I got to Immaculada and met Sinita and saw what happened to Lena and realized that I'd just left a small cage to go into a bigger one the size of our whole country. First time I met Sinita, she was sitting in the parlor where Sora Suncion was greeting all the new pupils and their mothers. 
She was all by herself, a skinny girl, with a sour look on her face and pokey elbows to match. She was dressed in black, which was odd as most of the children weren't put in morning clothes until they were at least 15. And she's a little girl, and this little girl didn't look any older than me, and I was only 12, though I would have argued with anyone who told me I was just a kid. I watched her. She seemed as bored as I was with all the polite talk in that parlor. It was like a heavy shaking of talcum powder in the brain, hearing all those mothers complimenting each other's daughters and lisping back in good Castilian to the sisters of the merciful mother. Where was this girl's mother, I wondered. She sat alone, glaring at everybody, as if she would pick a fight if you asked her where her mother was. I could see, though, that she was sitting on her hands and biting her bottom lip so as not to cry. The straps on her shoes had been cut off to look like flats, but they looked worn out, and was and that was, excuse me, they looked worn out was what they looked like. I got up and pretended to study the pictures on the walls like I was a lover of religious art. <laughs> when I got to the merciful mother right above Sunita's head, I reached in my pocket and pulled out the button I'd found on the train. It was sparkly like a diamond and had a little hole in the back so you could thread a ribbon through it and wear it like some romantic lady to wear it like a romantic lady's choker necklace it wasn't something i'd do but i could see the button would make a good trade with someone inclined in that direction i held it out to her i didn't know what to say and it probably wouldn't have helped anyway she picked it up turned it all around and then set it back down in my palm i don't want your charity i felt an angry tightness in my chest it's just a friendship button she looked at me a moment, uh, a deciding look that she couldn't be sure of anybody. Why didn't you just say so? She grinned as if she were already friends and, could t and we could tease each other. I did just say so, I said. I opened up my hand and offered her the button again. This time she took it. After our mothers left, we stood on a line while a list was made of everything in our bags. I noticed that along with not having a mother to bring her, Sunita didn't own much either. Everything uh, she had was tied up in a bundle, and when Sor Milagros uh, wrote it out, all it took was a couple of lines. Three, change of underwear. Four, pair of socks. Brush and comb. Towel and nightdress. Sunita offered the sparkly button, but Sor Milagros said it wasn't necessary to write that down. Charity student, the gossip went around. So, I challenged the giggly girl with the curls like hiccups who whispered it to me. She shut up real quick. It made me glad all over again I'd given Sunita that button. Afterwards, we were taken into an assembly hall and given all sorts of welcomes. Then Sor Milagros, who was in charge of the tens through twelves, took our smaller group upstairs into the dormitory hall where that we would share. Our side-by-side -side beds were already set up for the night with mosquito nets. It looked like a room full of little bridal veils. Sor Milagro said she would now assign us our beds according to our last names. Sunita raised her hand and asked if her bed couldn't be next to mine. Sor Milagro hesitated, but then a sweet look came over her face. Sure, she said. But when some other girls asked, she said no. I spoke right up. I don't think it's fair if you make an exception for us. Sor Milagro looked mighty surprised. I suppose being a nun and all, not many people told her what was right what was wrong and right. Suddenly, it struck me too that this plump little nun with a little bit of gray hair showing under her headdress wasn't mama or papa and I could argue things with. I was on the point of apologizing but Sor Milagros just smiled her gap to smile and said, all right, I'll allow you all to choose your own beds. But at the first sign of argument, some of the girls had already sprung towards the best beds by the window and were fighting about who got there first. We'll go back into alphabetical. Is that clear? Yes, Sor Milagros, we chorused. She came up to me and took my face in her hands. What's your name? She wanted to know. I gave her my name, and she repeated it several times like she was tasting it. Then she smiled like it tasted just fine. She looked over at Sunita, whom they all seemed partial to, and said, Take care of our dear Sunita. I will, I said, standing up straight like I'd been given a mission. And that's what it turned out to be, all right. A few, de a few days later, Sor Milagros gathered us all around for a little talk. Personal hygiene, she called it, 
I knew right away it would be about interesting things described in the most uninteresting way. <laughs> First, she said there have been some accidents. Anyone needing a canvas sheet should come see her. Of course, the best way to prevent a mishap was to be sure to visit our chamber pots every night before we got in bed. Any questions? Not a one. Then a shy, embarrassed look came on her face. She explained that we might very well become young ladies while we were at school this year. She went through a most tangled up explanation about the how and why and finished by saying we should start our complications. If we should start our complications, we should come see her. This time she didn't ask if there were any questions. I felt like setting her straight, explaining things simply the way Patria had explained them to me, but I guessed it wasn't a good idea to try my luck twice in the first week. When she left, Sunita asked me if I understood what on earth Sor Milagros had been talking about. I looked at her surprised. Here she'd been dressed in black like a grown-up young lady, and she didn't know the first thing. Right then, I told Sunita everything I knew about bleeding and having babies between your legs. She was pretty shocked, and beholden, she offered to trade me back the secret of Trujillo. What secret is that? I asked. I thought Patria had told me all the secrets. Not yet, Sunita said, looking over her shoulder. It was a couple of weeks before Sunita got to her secret. I'd forgotten about it, or maybe I just put it out of my mind, a little scared that I might find what I might find out. We were busy with classes and making new friends. Almost every night, someone or the other came visiting under our mosquito nets, or we visited them. We were two regulars. We had two regulars, Lords and Elsa, and soon all four of us started doing everything together. It seemed like we were all just a little different. Sunita was charity, and you could tell. Lords was fat, though as friends, we called her pleasantly plump when she asked, and, we, and she asked a lot. Elsa was pretty in an I told you so way, as if she hadn't expected to turn out pretty, and now she had to prove it. And me, I couldn't keep my mouth shut when I had something to say. The night Sunita told me the secret of Trujillo, I couldn't sleep. All day, I hadn't felt right, but I didn't tell Sor Milagros. I was afraid she'd stick me in the sick room, and I'd have to lie in bed listening to Sor Consuela reading uh, novenas for the sick and dying. Also, if Papa found out, he might change his mind and keep me home where I couldn't have any adventures. I was lying on my back, looking up at the white tent of the mosquito net and wondering who else was awake. In her bed next to mine, Sunita began to cry very quietly, as if she didn't want anybody to know. I waited a little, but she didn't stop. Finally, I stepped over to her bed and lifted the netting. What's wrong? I whispered. She took a second to calm down before she answered. It's Jose Luis. Your brother? We all knew he had died just this last summer. That's how Sunita came to be wearing black the first day. Her body began to shake all over with sobs. I crawled in and stroked her hair like Mama did mine whenever I had a fever. Tell me, Sunita, maybe it'll help. I can't, she whispered. We can all be killed. It's the secret of Trujillo. Well, all I had to be told was I couldn't know something for me to have to know it, so I reminded her, Come on, Sunita, I told you about babies. It took some coaxing, but finally she began. She told me stuff I didn't even know about her. I thought she was always poor, but it turned out her family used to be rich and important. Three of her uncles... Had even, were even friends of Trujillo, but they turned against him when they saw he was doing bad things. Bad things? I interrupted. Trujillo was doing bad things? It was as if I had just heard Jesus had slapped a baby, or our blessed mother <laughs> had not conceived him the immaculate conception way. That can't be true, I said, but in my heart I felt a china crack of doubt. Wait, Sunita whispered, her thin fingers finding my mouth in the dark. Let me finish. My uncles, had, they had a plan to do something to Trujillo, but somebody told on them, and all three were shot right on the spot. Sunita took a deep breath as if she were going to blow out all of her grandmother's birthday candles. But what bad things was Trujillo doing that they wanted to kill him? I asked again. I couldn't leave it alone. At home, Trujillo hung by the wall, hung on the wall by the picture of our Lord Jesus and a whole flock of the cutest lambs. Sunita told me as much as she knew I was shaking by the time she was through. According to Sunita, 
Trujillo became president in a sneaky way. First, he was in the army, and all the people who were above him kept disappearing until he was the one right below the head of the whole armed forces. The man who was the head general had fallen in love with another man's wife. Trujillo was his friend, and so he knew all about this secret. The woman's husband was a very jealous man, and Trujillo made friends with him, too. One day, the general told Trujillo he was going to be meeting this woman that very night under the bridge in Santiago, where people met to do bad things. So Trujillo went and told the husband, who waited under the bridge for his wife and his general, and shot them both dead. Very soon after that, Trujillo became head of the armed forces. Maybe Trujillo thought that the general was doing a bad thing by fooling around with somebody else's wife. I defended him. I heard Sunita sigh. Just wait, she said, before you decide. After Trujillo became head of the army, he got to talking to some people who didn't like the old president. One night, these people surrounded the palace and told the old president that he had to leave. The old president just laughed and sent for his good friend, the head of the armed forces. But General Trujillo didn't come and didn't come. Soon, the old president was the ex-president on an airplane to Puerto Rico. Then something that surprised even the people who had surrounded the palace, Trujillo announced he was the president. Didn't anyone tell him he wasn't right? I asked, knowing I would have. People who opened their big mouths didn't live very long, Sunita said, like my uncles I told you about. Then, two more uncles. And then my father. Sunita began crying again. Then this summer, they killed my brother. My tummy ache had started up again. Or maybe it was always there, but I'd forgotten about it while trying to make Sunita feel better. Stop, please, I begged her. I think I'm going to throw up. I can't, she said. Sunita's story spilled out like blood from a cut. One Sunday, this last summer, her whole family was walking home from church. Her whole family meant all Sunita's widowed aunts and her mother and tons of girl cousins and her brother Jose Luis being the only boy left in the entire family. Everywhere they went, the girls were assigned places around him. Her brother had been saying that he was going to revenge his father and uncles, and the rumor all over town was that Trujillo was after him. As they were rounding the square, a vendor came up to sell them a lottery ticket. It was the dwarf they always bought from, so they trusted him. Oh, I've seen him, I said. Sometimes, when we would go to San Francisco in the carriage and pass by the square, there he was, a grown man, no taller than me at twelve. Mama never brought from him. He claimed Jesus told us not to gamble and playing the lottery was gambling. But every time I was alone with Papa, he bought a whole bunch of tickets and called it a good investment. Jose Luis asked for a lucky number. When the dwarf went to hand him the ticket, something silver flashed in his hand. That's all Sunita saw. Then Jose Luis was screaming horribly and her mother and all the aunts were shouting for a doctor. Sunita looked over at her brother and the front of his shirt was covered with blood. I started crying, but I pinched my arms to stop. I had to be brave for Sunita. We buried him next to my father. My mother uh, hasn't been the same since. Sor Asuncion, who knows my family, offered to let me come to El Colegio for free. The aching in my belly was like a wash being wrung so tightly there wasn't a drop of water left in the clothes. I'll pray for your brother, I promised her, but Sunita, one thing. How is this Trujillo secret? You still don't get it? Minerva, don't you see? Trujillo is having everyone killed. I lay awake most of that night, thinking about Sunita's brother and her uncles and her father and the secret of Trujillo that nobody but Sunita seemed to know about. I heard the clock down in the parlor, striking every hour. It was already getting light in the room by the time I fell asleep. In the morning, I was shaken awake by Sunita. Hurry, she was saying. You're going to be late for matins. All around the room, Sleepy girls were clapping away in their slippers toward the crowded basins in the washroom. Sunita grabbed her towel and soap dish from her night table and joined the exodus. As I came fully awake, I felt the damp sheet under me. Oh, no, I thought. I've wet my bed. After I told Sir Milagros that I wouldn't need an extra canvas sheet on my mattress, I lifted the covers and for a moment I couldn't make sense of the dark stains on the bottom sheet. Then I brought up my hand from checking myself. Sure enough, my complications had started.